Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker. I am an author, speaker, and professor of Holy Land Studies at the Israel Bible Center. I am passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day. And I love having geeky conversations with people about new things. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members of IBC to discover new aspects of the Bible. These are some of my favorite dialogues because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. Happy New Year to everyone. Last week, we started a new project here at the Israel Bible Podcast. We are building a foundation for biblical interpretation. And although I will admit to being biased, I think that foundation begins with the physical context where events happened. Today, Dr. Yeshai Gruber and I continued the discussion about my IBC course called Listening to the Land of the Bible, Part 1. Dr. Gruber is the professor of Jewish history and culture at IBC, and he conducts all of the roundtable talks with world-renowned scholars. So instead of me simply talking about my own course, I enlisted Dr. Gruber to help me out for this series. Thank you for being here and for taking on the role. It is my privilege and honor. I am really thrilled to be able to ask you about your courses on listening to the land of the Bible. I get to sit in her chair, so to speak, today and ask her questions. And I'm sure it's going to be a really fascinating and interesting discussion. Now, just to warm you up to the conversation, you may remember last week when we talked about how even though the land is often overlooked by many readers of the Bible, it is absolutely essential to understanding the biblical narrative. And we talked about what kind of things it says through the seemingly mundane issues like the agricultural calendar. This week, we start with a much broader look at the ancient Near East and how the land of the Bible fits into the larger landscape. So pull out a map and follow along. Now I have a hard question, a bit of a hard question, maybe. I'm wondering how all of this fits into the broader context of the ancient Near East. I mean, both in terms of the land itself, the, how does the land of Israel, Eretz Israel, relate to the the broader geographical area, and also how does the God of this region, the God focused who keeps his eyes on this this yeah. land, relate to the other gods of the region? I love this question because once we start talking about it, again, there's a thousand different application points that come from this, but I'll just do the bird's eye view. I'll just like in general. And I already sort of mentioned it a little bit when we were talking about Egypt. Um, Egypt is the Southern part of the Fertile Crescent. The the land of Mesopotamia is the Northern part of the Fertile Crescent and Eretz Israel is in the middle. And so the Northern, the Mesopotamia and the Egypt areas are very similar in that they have rivers that consistently have fresh water, that consistently flood their banks, that provide amazing soil. It's in both of these two areas that we see the birth of civilization, of people going from hunter-gatherers to actually planting grains um, and staying sedentary, not sedentary, but... um, in one place instead of roaming and following hunting seasons. So this is really important. Both of these areas with their big rivers uh, facilitate communication. They facilitate um, economies. They facilitate bringing clans of people together to form nations. They facilitate funding governments and building Uh, armies that can go out and conquer the world. It's the land itself is allowing for that to happen and providing the resources necessary for that to happen, which is very different than the middle part of the Fertile Crescent, which has been called all kinds of different things throughout time. Um, But the land of the Bible is even a small portion 
of the middle part of the Fertile Crescent. And it has mountains and valleys. It has really difficult terrain to cross, uh, to get from one portion of land to another. It has all these different ecosystems. So if you're on the eastern side of the mountain versus even just five kilometers away on the western side of the mountain, you have a whole different type of environment. There's no regular access to water, which means the land itself is functioning to pull people apart to keep them isolated in their communities. So where the land on the edges of the Fertile Crescent unites people, the land in um, in the land of the Bible is pulling people apart, which makes economies difficult to build, governments difficult to build. Uh, it pulls tribes apart instead of uniting tribes, right? So government is hard, uh, you know, all of these things about the land, as we said even earlier, is vulnerable. And so it doesn't even have the resources to pay for an army to go out and conquer the world. Uh, so all of this is telling us that this land is a vulnerable place. It's almost inconsequential. You could, you could say that if you were Egypt or Mesopotamia, that land is almost inconsequential. And I say almost on purpose because it does have a, a very positive value to it. It's interesting. And one of the things, like once we kind of understand the big picture, I love reading the book of Genesis and going, well, Abram and his family are from the lands of Mesopotamia. And God calls him into the land and then because of a famine, uh, so again, we're seeing the land is being very vulnerable, falling into a famine. Abram and Sarai go to Egypt. And then God says, go back to the place I told you to go. So they go back to the land. Isaac, you know, one of his descendants goes up to Mesopotamia and God says, go back. And he goes back to the land. So there's an interesting bit about how in so many different places, God's people could have ended up in Mesopotamia or in Egypt, in world-dominating places. And consistently, God told them to go to that middle part of the Fertile Crescent where the land is difficult. It's impossible to go out and conquer the world from that place. And I think even that is just a brilliant thing for us to sit on and say, okay, what does God think about empires? <laughs> what does God think about the way that he wants his people to be an example to the world, right? If he's purposefully putting them in a place that cannot conquer the world, then maybe that wasn't his goal from the beginning. So it pulls up these really interesting types of conversations that, that we can have that I think are really fascinating. You know, I was actually reading an article this week that was published this week about a topic like that, um, how the Torah views... Uh, empire, how God presents empire, essentially. Um, and it relates to the story of another descendant of Abraham who went down to Egypt, and that is Joseph. Yes. Now, speaking speaking of all these connections and the place of Eretz Yisrael within that world, um, the story of Joseph has so many points yeah. <laughs> of connection to the kinds of things you're talking about that it would be impossible for us to even scratch yeah. the surface here. But maybe let me just ask you about roads. Why do you have to know about roads to have a clue what's going on in the Joseph yes. story? Yes. <laughs> I love this because people think roads are so boring. Like, why do I need to be tested on where the roads went? <laughs> and I'll say if Everyone listening to podcasts, if you can just think of a place that you like to go hiking or walking. For me, I live in Philadelphia. There's a park nearby. I love and adore this park so much. I spend so much time, especially during pandemic seasons in this park. There are little, little tiny trails that snake their way up through the hills of the park. There are fewer people on those trails. If you're walking with a friend, you have to walk one behind the other because the trail is so narrow. It's a much more challenging kind of a trail to be on. 
Now, down in the valley of this park, right next to the river, there's a huge, wide trail. An automobile could drive down that road if it wanted to. And always there are so many more people down on that path, on the big path. It just pulls like a magnet, people who are walking with kids and with dogs and bicyclists who are going. It's an easier trail. It's not as challenging of a trail. So even when I take these two images and I think of the ancient world, the ancient world had the equivalent of really small trails where only local traffic went and only like fewer people would be on those trails, as opposed to the great big, huge wide roads where all the armies would go and caravans of traders would go. So this is important for the Joseph story. It's, again, you have to read the story with a map in hand. And in the course, I, I use tons of different maps and draw all over them to really try to help this point come to life. But in the Joseph story, Joseph starts. So um, Isaac and Joseph are in the south part of the hill country in Hebron. Joseph's brothers have already gone gone to a a more northern city of Shechem, uh, also in the hill country to the north, uh, to take their sheep up there. And what's interesting is there there are still a few Bedouin tribes who still make this seasonal route from Hebron to Shechem, which is really interesting. But so Isaac tells Joseph, go check on your brothers. They're in the fields around Shechem. And so Joseph goes. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how he walked, like what route did he take? But it is plainly obvious if you know the land, there's one route he would take, and it would be a local road, an important road, but a local road that goes along the crest line of the hill country. So he goes to Shechem. His brothers aren't there. He finds someone out in the fields. And the guy says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm just, I'm looking for my brothers. And the guy goes, oh, they're just around the bend. And it really is like when you see the land itself, you really just kind of go around like this little foothill part of the mountain. And then you're in this wide open valley called the Dotan Valley. And that's where his brothers were. So Joseph goes. And then of course we get the conflict between Joseph and his brothers and His brothers decide that they're going to not kill him, but sell him into slavery. And then in the text, we see, oh, on the horizon line, there's a caravan coming from the hills of Gilead. And they're coming through and they're passing through the Dotan Valley on their way down to Egypt. This explanation working for you, I am such a visual person that it is killing me that I don't have a map to show you right now. For my own sanity, please go find one and follow along. Now, what's interesting is when Joseph was in the area of Shechem in the hill country, he was on that little tiny road, the local road. Only locals would be passing through there or people specifically who are going there to trade. When he goes just around the bend, it's not even that far away, but he moves from a local road into the Dotan Valley where the primary international highway runs through that valley. And anyone, any of the caravans that are going to trade between Gilead the region of Gilead and Egypt passes through that valley. So, and again, this is not specific in the text unless you understand the geography and you realize Joseph went from an internal small road onto the primary road, which allowed for his brothers to have an option to killing him. They can sell him into slavery, which ultimately in God's grand scheme of things is going to provide for all the descendants of uh, Jacob, for Joseph and all of his brothers and all of the descendants as they all ultimately follow him down into Egypt. Amazing. And I think in the Dotan region also, it's surrounded by um, pits. Yep. 
uh, in the ground, which is so interesting because it's also just one of those details of the story you might pass over. Mm -hmm. Uh, where the brothers, I think Reuben says, let's throw them into one of these pits. Yep. Well, it so happens that at that place, there are lots of pits around that they could have thrown him into. You were talking about maps and how you use them in the course. And I love maps. I mean, I love hiking. uh, So I I need those trail maps, those topographical maps. You know, I love that. (laughs) Um, I'm also a historian, of course. So I like historical maps and they're linked to the, you know, the history of human exploration and discovery. Um, Early maps show parts of mythology, you know, where areas of the world were not known. And and of course, you deal with that a lot in ancient times. It's so interesting to see the connection between maps and worldview. Um, Even, you know, what we call religion was not separated from geography for them. Uh, So, so interesting. And just as a fun aside, I am jumping in to let you know, I will put a link in the episode notes that will take you to the oldest map we have. It is the Babylonian map of the world, and it's in the British Museum. It is fascinating to think about humans drew maps according to what they experienced and what they knew about without having the technology we have now to understand the world as a globe. So we create maps and the way we draw them explains our own priority. So take for instance, the old maps I grew up with, and I know I'm totally dating myself here, but they were maps of the world. But the U.S. was right in the middle of the map, demonstrating the priority, which also meant that Southeast Asia was oddly split in half. And half of it was on the far right side of the map. Half of it was on the far left side of the map, which made it impossible to figure out how those lands actually connected. Now, other countries have done this too, where they draw maps with themselves right in the middle. So basically they're explaining the world according to their own perspective. Now, think of our modern technology. When we pull up a map on our smart devices, who is in the center? You are. How do you think that influences the way we understand the world around us? Food for thought. Now let's get back to what Dr. Gruber was pondering about maps. So I I really enjoy maps, but I must confess, I probably look at them usually as a kind of tool, a means to an end. But you've mentioned to me before that maps played a role in changing the direction of your life and not just moving from one road to another road, but (laughs) your exposure. (laughs) Not in a Joseph way. (laughs) Not in a Joseph way, but, but just your exposure to maps helped change the way you thought about yourself and... God and uh, the Bible and life in general. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I went through, as a young adult, a period where I was trying to decide if I even believed in God and if systems of religion were ridiculous or if they were rooted in anything that I could relate to. And this was a really difficult struggle for me. And it's interesting Maps came in such a surprising way. I decided kind of on a whim, someone had invited me to participate in this study where we had these huge maps and we got to color on them. So we would highlight roads and we would mark regions and then we read different biblical stories and mapped them out on the maps. These maps were from Biblical Background, and I will add a link to their website in the episode notes. I highly recommend that if anyone is interested in interacting with maps and biblical history, that you buy their seven large maps and then download their marking guide and then draw all over the maps. Tell them I sent you. You're not going to regret it. Okay, back to my story. That experience for the very first time, maybe not very first time, but it it was such a poignant experience to me to go, oh, there's a reality that is undergirding these sacred scriptures. Uh, there was a real people connected to real places during a real time, and they fought real battles, and they had real life struggles, 
and they had real emotions. And I suddenly was relating to this ancient culture and ancient belief system in a way I hadn't been able to relate. And what I saw was suddenly I, I was seeing people not as theological characters. So not a character whose only mission was to hold a theological message for us. I saw these people as real people having real struggles, making real decisions. And the more I understood their land, the more I was interacting on maps and drawing, the more I thought, you know what, I probably would have made the same decision that they made <laughs> to reject God, to question his goodness and provision. Um, and so that experience actually pulled me into doing graduate work in biblical studies, which surprised absolutely everyone that I knew, except maybe two people. <laughs> no one thought I would go in that direction, but I did. And I attribute a lot of that to that exercise of making the biblical world anchored onto the real world. And it was hugely influential in everything that I did after that. Really interesting. And thank you for sharing that. Um, I think many people can probably relate to those types of questions. Next week, we conclude our conversation about the land with taking an example out of the narrative of David and Goliath and discussing what the geography contributes to that story. Then Dr. Gruber throws in this question. Does geography determine human events? I'd be really curious to know how you would answer that question. Make sure that you subscribe, like, or follow this podcast on whichever podcast provider you use so you don't miss the conclusion to our discussion. Thank you for joining us in this new year. If you like what you hear in the podcast, you'll love exploring Israel Bible Center certificate program on Jewish context and culture, or just follow the links in the episode notes and find out how you can get listening to the land of the Bible and many other courses with one small monthly subscription. And as a thank you for listening to this podcast, use the coupon code Israel when you register to receive a free surprise. Thank you to Jeremy McDonald with Mason Jar Music for mixing, editing, and crafting all the good sounds you hear. And thank you for being curious about the world of the Bible. I look forward to our conversation next week. Mm -hmm.